Um, I'm Dr. Jackie Wong from Creamer Hospital. And uh, I know this is a very late afternoon in the Sunday, uh, sat uh, Saturday night. Uh, so um, my, I want to share with you uh, the topic of endoscopic osteopathy under local anesthesia that we have been doing in our hospital. So I uh, have low financial disclosure. So um, why, uh, why I'm choosing this topic is that um, I think that endoscope, endoscope is a very good uh, instrument to illustrate the anatomy and also the pathology of the middle ear. So uh, actually, if you have been staying with us, uh, I know everyone know uh, Professor Zhang Waiji is an expert in the endoscopic ear surgery. And it is actually quite nervous for me to show my work uh, in, in front of her. So, uh, but she is a very good friend of, of mine. So, uh, Maybe I'll try to illustrate uh, how good this instrument is uh, by this video. So um, this is a case of a, a lady who had the white conductive hearing loss. Um, and then I, after I elevate the yeah, tympanic membrane, you can see that the malleus handle is relatively mobile, but the in, in long process for incas is fixed. And uh, it took me some time to remove the sputum uh, to expose the body of the in incus, but you can see that uh, after I expose the most part of the incus, I still cannot find the pathology that caused the fixation of this incus. But uh, after I further advance my endoscope further, you can see that there's actually a little piece of bone formation that connects the body of the incus towards the horizontal segment of the facial left over here. So you can, if you read the CT, the pathology is over here. So um, if you have been doing a um, osteopathy using a microscope, I think it is uh, very difficult to, to identify this pathology uh, as uh, you can imagine the vision would be along a, a strict line of sight and you cannot find this pathology without removing the incus and, uh, and by doing so. And uh, after I, I was able to remove this piece of bone by a bone curet and you can see that after the removal of that piece of bone, the ossicular chains become mobile again. And, uh, why, and also another advantage of the using endoscope in osteopathy is that it is a relatively mi minimal invasive technique. It is very well tolerated under local anesthesia. You don't have to uh, use uh, a very big incision to assess the middle ear. And uh, you may also want to ask, why want to do the operation under local anesthesia? So uh, I can tell you that I have been doing uh, osteopathy using uh, general anesthesia in the past, but uh, I found that there's something uh, always missing. I cannot know the results until very late after the follow-up. For example, uh, uh, after I have done the osteopathy, either be a, a stabidectomy or a, a total prophesis, um, uh, I visited the patient in the recovery room and asked whether they had a subjective improvement after the surgery. But uh, it's very, very difficult for them to tell me immediately because uh, sometimes uh, there's a lot of packing inside the external ear and also there's a lot of blood filling up the middle ear cavity. So that uh, um, sometimes they may able to tell me there's a little bit improvement, but uh, you cannot know what you have been doing a good or you have been doing that uh, uh, during the surgery until you uh, uh, see them in the clinic a few uh, weeks later and also maybe a few months later to perform the pure tone audiogram. But by the time you, you may already forgot what you have been doing during the operation. So there's a, a, a very, relatively uh, no direct feedback from the patient. But um, for the local asphyxia case is a real different story. You can actually have a direct feedback from the patient, uh, not up immediately after the surgery, but during the surgery. You can talk to them and also they can report to you whether there's a, a good transmission of this, uh, sound from the, uh, uh, from the air conduction to, uh, to what they perceive. So you can actually adjust the best position of the offices and also choose the best length of the positions you, you choose.
uh, for the surgery. So I like to use this uh, type of uh, prophesis is called the uh, curse uh, TTT uh, various system. Actually, it allows you to have an adjustable length of the prophesis to be used. Uh, by doing so, you don't have to uh, keep a, a different length of the prosthesis in your operation theater. Uh, for example, you have to like keep eight to 10 of the different size of prosthesis in your operation theater of, of uh, both uh, pop and also top uh, in order to have, uh, have a, a stop of uh, each size. But, um, yes, but some of the time you may not able to use up all the stock and then uh, some of the product will be waste after the uh, expiry day. And uh, each product is not uh, cheap uh, as well. Uh, each one uh, would cost a few hundred, uh, a few thousand dollars in Hong Kong. So, and apart from the uh, this uh, merit of able to adjusting the length, uh, the other merit would be that uh, each package will come with a, a blue plastic uh, dummy prosthesis on uh, showing over here. You can actually cut out all these dummy prosthesis and put in the middle ear to try and test it out. And uh, you can actually use the dummy prosthesis of different size, and then and you can ask the patient whether there's actually a good transmission or sound, and then you use that measurement on the real prophesis uh, later on. And let me show you there's a mini case series of the obstacles past the we have been performing in Dongwa Hospital and Queen Hospital using this uh, system. Uh, we have been performing seven of them in the past six months. Uh, uh, there's are four of them are being primary cases. Uh, majority of them are like uh, post mastoidectomy patients. Uh, they had uh, received a mastoidectomy uh, age ago. Uh, for, uh, that uh, they uh, there is a relatively dry uh, dry uh, mastoid cavity, and also there is a, a relatively limitized middle ear. Mm -hmm. There's no scarring at all, recurrence of coatoma or in those cases. So uh, we choose those cases as a second stage uh, ossicular chain reconstruction. Uh, so this case could be taught very well uh, under an local anesthesia. And also another uh, uh, three cases are from relation cases. We have, uh, some of them have received uh, uh, either a partial or a total prophesis before uh, they, the prophesis or either dislodge uh, inferiorly to the hypotympanium or shift down inferiorly, maybe due to gravity or loosening of the uh, tympanic membrane. And uh, the last case uh, is a case that uh, we, uh, the previous surgeon had uh, used a relatively short uh, prophesis that uh, the middle end of the, 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 the prophesis is not in good contact with the uh, foot page. So let me show you a cases of a uh, post mastoidectomy patient. Uh, here is, uh, uh, we only we only need a, only a few millimeter of uh, local anesthesia to anesthetize this uh, operation. So we can see that uh, the foot page is mobile and we put in a piece of cartilage to protect graph from the prophesis. And this is the dummy prophesis I mentioned before. You can um, cut one and then measure uh, uh, whether to see whether it is in good position. And then we return the fab back to cover the graph and also back to your position. And then we'll ask the patient whether they perceive a, a good sound transmission um, from this uh, uh, prophesis. So, uh, if the dummy prophesis show a very promising result, we will uh, remove it and then we will put in the real prophesis using the titanium uh, material. And then uh, afterwards, we return the fab and the operation will be finished. So um, this um, this operation is done under local anesthesia. You only require a face more incision over the mastoid cavity around this area. And uh, usually two mil of uh, local anesthesia will be enough. If the patient uh, receives some pain during the manipulation of the middle ear, you can infuse a few uh, mil of uh, airway more into the middle ear cavity and, and that would be uh, enough to uh, uh, for us to perform the operation. And uh, 
this is a case of the revision of circular opacity that a previous uh, top, uh, top was uh, inserted, but uh, the result was not good. There's a persistent airborne gap. As you can see, when I remove the last uh, prophesis being inserted, you can see the shaft of this prophesis was bent. So that uh, there was not a good contact with the foot page and the uh, of and also the graph, and then uh, you can insert the uh, dummy prophesis using different size, and you can see this is a six point zero millimeter one, and then we insert the prophesis dummy prophesis into the position, and then we return the graph, and then we ask the patient whether they perceive a good transmission of sound, and so after. Uh, we got the correct size, then we can uh, use the real prophesis and you can see we test with the Rosen needle, it's a very stable and also a very good position and then we return the graph and the operation will be finished. And usually this operation could be finished within an hour, so the nodal anesthesia would be enough and no need to re-infuse uh, further local anesthesia. And, uh, so for the results, uh, we have shown the result over here. For the blue chart is the PIOP airborne gap. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the green column would be the post-op airborne gap. You can see that uh, all of them receive a, uh, uh, after operation, they can uh, have a re uh, major reduction of the airborne gap to within 20 decibel uh, from the um, mean P-operative uh, airborne gap for around 40, to 14 after the operation. So, and this is a short video clip of showing how we do it uh, in uh, operation theater. So uh, this is a young trainee or uh, a colleague of mine. She's a talented uh, hand surgeon who is also interested in uh, endoscopic knee surgery. So uh, I was helping her to put in a uh, dummy prosthesis over uh, the stable superstructure, and this is how you can perform a free hand technique if you really need some help. And um, after we put in the prophesis and then we return the graph. So you can see that uh, there's a chain ear William is trying to apply a trigger walk to the normal hearing ear, and then we do uh, we then perform a free field voice test with whispering to the operating ear and ask her to repeat these numbers. So uh, this is very good uh, uh, free field voice test. We're using whispering to test whether the patient have a good feedback from the uh, from this uh, prophesis being inserted. And afterwards, we will put in the wheel prophesis uh, using a titanium type of material. So, um, but sometimes uh, we do have some hours expectation after we uh, lift up the tympanic membrane. Let me sh uh, share with you some interesting cases during uh, my career. So this is, uh, is a young gentleman who uh, suffering from a maximum airborne gap over the right side. And I tried to perform an osteoplasty under local anesthesia for this patient. But after I open up the tympanic membrane, uh, there's uh, something that uh, a a structure that pass between the anterior cruise and the posterior cruise of the stabies. And actually, actually this is a facial nerve that uh, is uh, pass, uh, having a abnormal anatomical, anatomical position. And unlike Professor Zhang uh, from China, who was able to perform the stabidectomy in a dehesion facial nerve, uh, I, I dare not operate on this patient because actually, the stabies may be mobile and also I cannot actually see the oval window around this area. So I choose to call it a day and then uh, say bye-bye to this facial love. And uh, there's another interesting case is that uh, uh, there's a patient receive a uh, 
um, mine go past the operation uh, previously in our department for a perfect ear jump, but uh, she had a, a persistent airborne gap afterwards. So we put her under, uh, uh, put her back into operation theater and do a um, uh, tympanotomy and also possible also capacity under local anesthesia again. But uh, I was expecting some scarring in around the ossicle, like uh, webbing around the incus or the medius. But actually, what is happening is that the is uh, the CB is fixed by the autosclerosis. So this is a autosclerosis in a perforated ear jump patient. So it's really rare. Uh, but I then proceed to an uh, stabidectomy under local anesthesia. And uh, I know a lot of experts has been doing it from time to time, but for me, it's really the first time to do it under local anesthesia. I was quite nervous. When I used the drill to drill the posterior cool for the patient, I asked her every two minutes whether she received any um, discomfort, any dizziness, any in, intolerable loud sound that transmit to her inner ear um, that I would, I would stop the operation for uh, uh, and if that anything happens. But uh, luckily the operation went smooth and after operation, the patient thank, thank you me uh, uh, very gratefully and that she was very impressed. I'm a very caring doctor uh, for um, showing empathy for her to relieve her anxiety during the operation. But actually it's rather my anxiety uh, that to be relieved uh, by asking her instead. So um, lastly, I also want to show you and some of the uh, osteopathy that uh, is very difficult to deal with that this is a case of a CSOM that has lots of the tympan uh, that web around the stabi superstructure. This is the stabi head over here. You can see I cannot remove it with this needle. I was trying to use a drill to remove those uh, dense uh, uh, ossified uh, tympan around the superstructure. I was able to mobilize it a little bit, but um, actually uh, the results is not very, uh, uh, very good. I think that uh, maybe I have not removed enough of these tumor sclerosis or either these tumor sclerosis come back very quickly after the operation. So after mobilized the superstructure, I put back the incus transposition uh, back to where it should be, but uh, sometimes the results are not that uh, uh, that good compared with those uh, with a relatively uh, less uh, extensive tympan sclerosis in the middle year uh, with these cases. So um, uh, things to improve for our operation is that I think we can use a more alternative intraoperatively uh, hearing assessment uh, to assess rather than the uh, free field voice test with a whisper and also uh, trigger walk. I have been thinking maybe we can use a uh, airport that web around a uh, sterile plastic and then deliver sound to the patient for hearing assessment using an app from iPhone or something. And also we can also use uh, some better pre-op imaging using combined CT that has a high resolution rather than the normal uh, temple C temple that we are using right now. So um, uh, lastly, I want to share some of my experience as a ENT trainee. When I was a ENT trainee, I went to a lot of course in autology. I was told that and being an autologist, the most important thing is to create a safe, dry ear to the patient. But how about hearing? The, most of the time, uh, the first thing to sacrifice would be the hearing. But uh, during my career, I, would, I was trying to uh, restore the hearing of my patients um, as much as possible. And I hope my talk can induce uh, some of the future fellows that they would pursue the role of the autology in the future. Thank you.